All right, moving along to main topic, the con game. Yeah. As in running, planning, creating, and running a game at conventions. Big, big cons, not so big cons. And for our reference, Cabin Con. Right. Yeah. And we haven't talked about Cabin Con for a long we time. Well, you know, our uh, winter meeting is going to be coming up. I got to make a decision. Yeah. I think Patrick may be hosting again, maybe not. So uh, sometime in November, guys, if you're listening, my cabin Connors, we're probably going to sometime in November, we're going to be having that meeting. So probably expect the first or second week. I'll, I will be once because October hits end of this week. So I got to I got to get it out there. Patrick will probably hear this tomorrow. And so he'll have to let me know and if he's going to host. We'll do it at his house and uh, do it all again. Right. Talk about so what we're going to do, where we're headed, who's yeah. coming, and all that good stuff for new listeners and uh hopefully viewers yeah. cabin con is our annual get together with our gaming gaming bros yep uh, mostly the ones that are um local to us here in michigan um yes. does anybody come out of state anymore big d does from ohio um but he, he's missed the last couple so i don't know if he's coming or not yeah if he doesn't show this year again i mean yeah we're gonna have nobody he's gonna be all in-staters right so, so. Yeah, so it's a, a long weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where we just get together and play games. We we, we don't go very far, but no. it's a nice it's a nice set of cabins mm-hmm. out at what's the name of it again? Lake George Resort. Check it Lake, out if you're here in Michigan. Lake George Resort. Um, it's uh, our con, con away from cap uh, from uh, our con away from Gen Con. Really. Yeah, it's not. Um, yeah, it's a different beast. Uh, yeah. And so we usually break out and play games. So I kind of tried to pick some just in general. This is what I think about. First is when you're thinking about making a game or creating a game for Cabin Con or any, or any other convention. Uh, you have to if you're going to a Gen Con type style where the game is set and they have two hour, four hour slots, whatever it is, you definitely have to consider your time constraints. Um. At Cabin Con, we have a little more freedom. Yeah. So when you're considering a game, if you're going to run a game, if you're going to run a game for four hours, Joe, mm-hmm. what do you think about? You say, okay, I got like, you know, I want to fit this in a four hour window. So how does, how does time affect your planning for the game? Well, you have to think about encounters. Yep. Especially if you're running uh, any combat, uh, a game more focused on combat, which most of them are. Yes. But um, if you're going to do a four hour slot, you're probably not going to have more than four combat encounters. Probably. So probably more like three. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to have time for RP, maybe have a non-combat encounter. It depends on what you're going to run. If you're right. going to run a combat intensive session, then uh, you really have to, you might still plan a couple extra, mm-hmm. um, unless you're doing the whole railroad thing. Right. Where you're the conductor and they follow you or they don't and you don't have a game. But the truth is, would you say, though, that's a good point. Is there advantage to being a conductor in a con game? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, for both players and DMs. Yes. But the DM yes. conductor, it can be advantageous, right? Especially at uh, the, a slotted, a timed slot at mm-hmm. a large or even a smaller con. Mm-hmm. Not as, as important as at our more relaxed um, environment, but mm-hmm. if you pay for four hours, right. and then if someone pays for four hours to sit at your table, you need to give them four hours of game time. I agree. And you can't be worried about player agency that much as far as that goes. Well, I don't think I can. I think another thing to consider is, especially for the convention, I ran a few years at Gen Con. I ran back then the second edition days, uh, never ran. I don't think I ever ran third edition game, did run Pathfinder. They were all four hour slots, but you got to, at a big convention, you got to collect tickets. You got to pass out characters or role characters. We're going to do, we're talking about that in a minute. So you got some, you got some uh, housekeeping to do at the beginning. And it used to be back when I went to Gen Con in the early nineties, you had housekeeping at the end because they would a lot of games are like you'd vote to see who the best role player was and they'd get a little prize. Uh, Gen Con would su- supply the prizes. Um, 
another thing about time, I know my first year, there was a game that lasted 12 hours. I saw it in the books. There was a 12-hour wow. RPG. And there were some that had that were tournaments. So you would play four hours on Thursday, four hours on Friday. And uh, four hours on Thursday, if you made it to the second round, you played four hours on Friday. If you made it to the final round, you'd play four hours on Saturday. So we don't see that sort of thing too much in cabin con where we tend to do four hour slots but i've been thinking why do we do that i mean we don't you don't have to even though we, i know it's set up nicely but we could just nobody ever just run we've said it before yeah. nobody ever just runs a i'm gonna run an eight hour game well i think the couple of times it's happened there's been uh some yammering about it because you know other people are wanting to get their game started and if their players are in the longer running games they're kind of screwed but um, I think at Cabin Con, we can. Yeah. And I, I think we have run longer than four yeah. hour sessions. I, I did not on purpose, at least one year. Yeah. And um, except for, like I said, a few, a little, you know, some talk, um, it's, it's gone over well. And, it and just I think takes, it, it takes some, you know, planning and adjusting. And, you know, yeah. since we're all buds, it, yeah. It's not a huge deal. It's just like, oh, I was waiting forever. I think, I think though, it's become such a such an expectation of four hours at CabinCon that if you're if I'm going to run a six hour game, I should I, I wouldn't feel obligated to announce it. Oh sure, sure. Hey, if you sign up for this in my morning game, we're not playing nine to one. We're playing nine to three. Right. So you're committed, you know, right. to play that. So don't, yeah. don't sign up if you don't want to be there for six hours. And I think the four hour slot thing is just from convention play in general yeah but so, i feel like it's pretty good i feel like four is kind of a magic number it fit, to me it does I, hmm. I think i think you're going to disagree with me go ahead for convention play sure but not in general no i meant for cabin con for cabin con oh well, yeah and gen con it works it works fine at cabin con you would not be opposed to longer games oh no okay not at all now yeah. if you do longer games that means you do fewer there's no yeah. way around that. No, there's not. Especially, at, yeah, in con, Gen Con, Cabin Con, any con, if you run a couple of long games, a couple of six or eight-hour games, your convention's almost over. Now, <laughs> what do you think about this? We're talking about timed and all that. Mm -hmm. On Legion of Myth, he brought, uh, they, they had a guest, and he said the way they did things, this is when it wasn't a con or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But they would they would uh, start playing Friday, play Saturday. They might even start a Thursday, but definitely Friday and Saturday and su su Sunday morning. So starting Friday afternoon, evening, going yeah. all the way through Saturday, like we used to do a long time ago. Oh yeah. So you could run a campaign that way. Yeah, and they would wow. they would play um, every month and a half, so every six weeks, let's say. So that's oh. why they went for the longer ones is they couldn't play every week. They didn't even play every month. That was their home game, though. That wasn't home a game. No, home game. But we could run a cabin con like that. Yeah. We just, and, and he said they had a lot of people. Really? So. Um, like you mean like double digits? Oh, yeah. Wow. So, so I think it's possible. And, you know, back in the day, we did run more people. Yeah, but it was six was six was low end back in the day. Yeah, so I think we could run big a big a big crowd, um, and just I don't, I don't know I don't know if people would want to do that though. Yeah, it's something to bring up. It'd be something to bring up. Oh well, you know you know I'm going to write that down. Business meeting, uh, campaign style where it's like really a campaign. We got a handful of folks I know wouldn't be interested, but that doesn't mean. Six, seven people couldn't go like, dude, I'd, would you be down to play Thursday a module or a, we're going to play Temple of Elemental Evil. Randy's going to bring the, he's got the return. He's got the um, Goodman Games one. We're going to jump right into Hamlet and we're going to run that on Thursday. And then Friday, we're going to the temple. <laughs> I mean, would you be down with that? And some people will be like, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want to spend your con doing that, do it. Um, but I think I'd need, if I'm going to run it, I would need uh, some commitment from people. Oh, sure. That I'm not going to, they're not going to bail on me four hours in because now to be fair, they can get bored and then it's my fault. But, mm -hmm. you know, 
you know, if, if everybody was getting bored, I'd probably bail. Um, what about pre-gens or not? Oh, cons? You got to do pre-gens. I, I feel like you have to, um, unless you're running a an RPGA style, or we've tried like, I had a thir- I have a 13th age game that I run at Cabin Con every year. And you guys are what, going to be seventh level this year? Yeah. And so um, every level of the players level up. And so it's campaign style, but it's still a four hour adventure. And after Cabin Con's over, if you play, whether you play or not, if you play in a couple of my games, 13th age, you get a level. Next right. year will be eighth level. Yeah. Um, but even that, short of that, if you're not running a campaign style repeat thing, most of the time people say being pre-gens, though we did run Elysium and Pathfinder where you could, in a game like that, where you can say 15 point build, seventh level characters, standard goal, go. Yeah. And, and let players have it. But I think a lot of times pre-gens, if you're going to introduce a new game, I think pre-gens are a must. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Definitely. What do you think about, I know you're not a big fan of big backgrounds, but what about a game, if I'm going to tell it, if we're going to have a, con, I said we're going to have a contained four-hour story, I mean, it's a one-shot, and I'm making pre-gens, how would you feel if the DM, because I've done this before, if I built in some motivations for your character? Yeah, a few sentences is one thing. Yeah, yeah that's not, fine. Not, or, or I used to do this too, connections between other characters. Yeah, that's so, cool. You feel this way about this guy. You and this guy have done this. That could be uh, that could be a good motivating thing. I think. I think that's not yeah. a bad idea. Given the now, it does give the the DM comes a little more author of your character, but that's okay. I think for a one shot. Um, would you like to roll your own when you sit down to do a one shot? Do you ever like that idea? It all depends. I mean, for a for a, for a con game, it would, yeah, it would, mm-hmm. uh, it's probably better just to have something ready for for me. I'd rather just pick something up and go. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to spend part of the four hours making a, uh, a character, I guess the only exception to that would be if it's a brand new game yeah. and we're trying to feel out if we want to play it. Maybe roll up characters. Yeah, you know, making a part of uh, the game is character creation. Mm-hmm. So that might be worthwhile, especially if you're, if, well, if it's just a one shot. I guess I it depends know. on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if what do you a, think about mm-hmm. one shot con game? Give me characters, right? I think Prefer- I'm preferable. I'm with you there mainly. I, I try to do that. Yeah, what about crunchier rules? Light, I mean, depends on if I know it, right? That's what I thought too. Yeah, if, if it's if it's Pathfinder, I'm fine. If it's yeah. 3x, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah, if it's riffs, I'm probably fine because I'll wing it. It's but similar it's a, enough. Yeah, if it gets too far outside of my wheelhouse and it's a really complicated, crunchy game, like, I don't know, say Shadowrun, which I played Shadowrun, I don't know if it was fourth or fifth edition once, and I just, the guy that ran it, I just could not. It wasn't that I was confused. I just didn't know what all the things on my character sheet meant, and he didn't explain things very well. We just started playing, and I could role play, and he would tell me, and I guess one thing you'd say, if you have the characters completed in a crunchy game, And the DM knows the rules well. So do you see where it says size modifier? Yeah, that's what you add to your damage right, or whatever. Right. No, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think both can work, but I think with Crunchy, I would definitely want a pre-gen. Um, rules light, I think it doesn't matter. Yeah, if it's uh, like an od and style rules light, you can, you can make a character in five minutes. Right. Even if you don't know the game. Right. An actual five, maybe 10 at the outside. Right. And then making a character is fine. Right. But I think mostly, uh, I think the crunchy and rules light, though, I don't think I have a, pre- we're talking about rules, I don't think I have a preference in a con game. I mean, you know, I thought Aliens was relatively light in the rules, even though it's got a big, thick book. There's not much, comp- there's not much complication in the rules, how they interact. Is it one of those where it's more complicated to make a character and then once you get into play, it's pretty simple? Actually, making characters in, in Aliens was pretty easy. Oh, okay. It's, it's all the way they interact, the roles you have to make, the D66 table. Mm. It's kind of weird. Once you master that, it's not it's not so bad. Um, yeah. Um, uh, for me, if I know the game or the DM or GM knows mm-hmm. the game mm-hmm. well, then mm-hmm. a complicated game still is fine. I've played a lot of different complex games. Yep. And I can handle just about any 
roll percentile here, roll this, that, and there. These are your powers. If, if, if the overview doesn't take too long and the, and the guy running the game knows what he's talking about, mm -hmm. I'm good. Yeah. Either too. way, either way, rules light or rules heavy, it doesn't matter. Okay. What about uh, experienced players or noobs? What do you think the pros and cons are on that? If you have a table full of experienced players versus a table full of several noobs. At a con, mm -hmm. um, I think at a con, it depends on how noob you're talking. If you're talking mm -hmm. about new to that game or new mm -hmm. to gaming in general, right? two different things. Yes. If it's new to gaming in general, then um, either the slot should be geared for that right. or um, uh, you should just make allowances as a player or and or DM. Well, we've got a new guy here. We're going to go slow. There's just all that's all there is to it. And I don't know if they still do it, but I know when I was first going to Gen Con the first few years, they had different levels. This game is, they would have like, I think they had them numbered one, two, three. If it was a three, it was experience required. You played this game a lot. You know the rules. Two means you played it once or twice. You understand the idea. One is you've heard about it and never played it. And so some games were, some game slots, some GMs were like, I only want experienced players. And That's I've fine. seen, I, and I only want noob players. Now, I don't, I don't um, I think at cabin cons, it's, this is a moot point because we just play with our buddies. And right, we'll, right. We'll make allowances if someone's never played a game before and we'll give them pre gens and we'll go after it. Correct. Um, I think as a, if you have a bunch of noobs, though, I think you're a little bit responsible to teach the game. I mean, to really teach it. So, yes. And even, and if you have experienced players playing a brand new game, if we've never played, you know, Mothership, which is a game I'm thinking about getting, it's getting ready to do a Kickstarter. Um, which is like aliens, but uh, I think even smaller in terms of thickness. So, um, you know, you got to teach the game too. And I've done that. Um, how about scenarios? So I think in a con game, especially if it's going to be a one-off, I think it's good to do very, to do challenging or unique adventures. I right. mean, I think it's better to like, okay, our adventure is to, kill the terror ask that's super cool because right. you don't do that much in a campaign no it's like whoa we're gonna be some totally powerful characters we're gonna go fight the terror ask awesome so write an adventure where the characters get to fight the terror ask or defeat it in some way um okay okay yep. wrinkle yes the dm says you got to fight and kill the terror ask okay. you get there expecting 20th level characters something like that and you end <laughs> up with seventh level characters you're like, what's the uh -huh. deal here? And well, you've got to figure out the chink in the armor. You find right. out, figure out that, and you can just bring them down. Otherwise, right. yeah. So what you might end up playing, any uh, so you would have, it doesn't have to be the Terrasque. Mm -hmm. It would have to be uber powerful. What would normally be an uber powerful monster, you would need high level characters in a D&D &D mm -hmm. type setting to defeat right. or even have a chance of it. Yeah. But you, you give them, to make it unique, you can give them low-level characters so they don't have a, a book to learn because yeah. you sit down at the table with a 20th-level character you've never played before. That's really challenging. Yeah. But well, yeah. a better yeah. challenge, I think, would have low-level characters, and then you have to figure out the secret to bringing down the Terrasque as 7th-level characters or then something like you, that. Right. Then it's unique and challenging. Or you yeah. could have, yeah. like... Or, or do things that are less common. Like, you know, in your campaign, you might fight orcs and do all sorts of mundane stuff. Well, in this adventure, folks, you guys are breaking into the third layer of hell and you're stealing from the vault of Geryon, the arch devil of that. I think he's level five, actually, but it doesn't matter. Okay, Prince, arch, arch devil Geryon. You got to steal stuff. So that would be a pretty unique scenario that could be fun. A high style game yes. where you're doing something really cool and... Uh, I think that could be really, I think that, that those kind of things to me kind of get my blood pumping when we're doing something cool like that. Right. Can it be fun to do the mundane though? We need to go guard the caravan. Well, it can be right now. Um, at, but I, you know, if you're going to a con and you're paying for a slot, 
you probably don't want to guard the caravan if if that's truly all it is if it's built as guard guarding the caravan and then it turns into something more interesting then that's fine or, the caravan's got a dark wagon all the windows are painted black and you can't see in it and you're transporting a vampire right that would be cool <laughs> yes so the another thing that maybe maybe the dm could say you're guarding a caravan it's up to you to make it interesting hit me with what you got you know whatever oh yep yeah. okay you could maybe do that but then you might look at the players at the table and they're all going huh well, I think you advertise that if you're doing a big con. Yeah. Um, I would say players, like if, even at Cabin Con, if I'm going to do something like that, I'm going to say I only want players that are willing to input in the story because yeah. I'm going to have a very loose plot. You guys are going to drive it. Yeah, Bill so is player driven. Player Here's driven. The Here's the premise. And I would tell you in advance, the premise is you're guarding a caravan. Think about what could make this interesting. Yeah. You know. Um, what about pvp i think that could be a unique thing in a one shot I mean, we did it with yeah we've these, done that a lot yeah I, I think that's not where you have a we talk about the plant right our yeah. buddy uh, not greg d but uh greg t <laughs> he got tagged as the plant a couple of times yeah and so yeah that makes the game as a one-off it's not so bad so if your your one shot wizard gets backstabbed by the rogue and killed yeah it sucks but yeah, story's over. It was cool. That's all yeah, right. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I think uh, from our point of view, the cabin Connors, we might have a unique, somewhat unique point of view on PVP, wherein we would say, yeah, we've done a lot of that. It's not really unique anymore. Um, no. I'd rather do something else. Yeah, it's- we actually created a cabin con campaign, Elysium, we've talked about that started out as just arena battles between characters. Yeah. So they didn't truly die. No. So you could bring the character back again. Right. So it was more, I think it was, it ended up becoming more a test of the system and yes. test, test of a player's adeptness at the system yep. than anything else. Yeah. How good are you at the build game? Yeah. And, and, and at, and at strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no nothing more terrifying to fight than a fellow player character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about managing the table at a con? I think that's important. You got to keep the pace, keep it exciting. It doesn't have to be, you know, you know, a frenzy of excitement, but you got to have some highs and lows. Um, I think with the number of players, you got to manage the table. You got to yeah. be make sure everybody can do what they do. You know, I would cat. You know, I cat. I have forever have cat myself the last few years at four or five players i find when i play old school six is fine i'm comfortable with six i've been doing that with the play test with mud sort i kind of like it because i know it's lethal at low levels i may want to change that at high levels who know who knows um but do you think are any of these things ever an issue that you can see from now, you've never been to a convention right an actual convention other no. than but yep yeah. that's that being said um i can see for a convention for people who are paying for their seat. Mm-hmm. Now, in general, I don't think it's the job of the DM to entertain. Right. Necessarily. necessarily. If you take that on, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the expectation is that I'm just going to sit here and you're going to entertain me. No. no. But uh, when you pay for a seat at a table, there's probably yeah. a higher expectation that the DM is supposed to provide a particular kind of experience and um, having those things, spotlight time, having a, having a good pace, having yeah. some kind of, um, inter- it doesn't necessarily have to be unique because what's unique these days, right. but, but definitely something engaging and interesting um, and having a good pace because you only have four hours. Yeah. You have to be able to, wrangle those characters down your path if right. they're not willing to just go i'm i'm pretty easy on bait so you can easily bait me down a path you look for the bait because you also yeah, want i want to because at cabin con you goes i want to play this dang story let's look for it a little bit i mean you don't and it's okay if, if a player kind of gets a little like you know makes me work for it they're not just gonna they're just not gonna bite immediately but 
I think I'm, I'll give you, I'll, I'll say, I'm going to buy the bait and I'll mm -hmm. put it in my mouth. Here's some string. Right. Yank me right. down the path. I right. mean, uh, I'll invent bait. I'll, uh, yeah, this guy, I'm going to talk to this guy or whatever. Right. It's, uh, but, um, but you have to be careful if, at least for us, I mean, if the players can get off on like a tangent at the spaceport and they start talking about getting to role play, they're into it. They're talking with the, with the, with the cute little uh, waitress and then they end up talking with each other and they're role playing role play. And you've done this for 25 minutes and be like, dude, we've only got less than three hours left. We got to get to this. And you're like, oh crap. You know, so you got to be careful. We've had times where, you know, when that fails, and this is something I've, I've learned only in recent years to narrate the end sometimes or narrate a portion i've had to narrate through a scene which i it feels a little it feels empty when i have to do that so okay you go in the room and you fight this lich and you run him off but you don't kill him now you come to the portal you know and i do that because i'm like oh crap look at my watch i'm like oh you gotta get your next game right and that's that that makes you feel bad as a dm when you've not planned that accordingly right and then you also what you want to make sure is I had something in my head and now it's gone. <laughs> you don't want to do this. Your four characters walk into a bar. What do you do? Not at a con. Not at a con. Oh, you don't, don't do that. So. No. You you really don't do that at your home ta table either all that much. No. But uh, you have to give a little more than that at home. But at a con, you can't do that. Yeah, in, in the play test for Mudsword, I'm kind of, I'm doing a little more like starting you off with the hook. You got the guy that sends you on the adventure initially, mm -hmm. just because we're going to get to the game. But in general, I wouldn't be inclined to say, what do you do? But I would throw some things at different people, and I would just see what you would bite on. You know, I wouldn't necessarily make it, here's the quest giver, you know. This would be something more like what you would do at a con with that intro. Instead yeah. of, you walk into a tavern, tavern, what do you do? No, yeah. you say all four of you wake up naked in a, in a four by four concrete cell. What do you do? Yeah. That's now what, yeah. And I, I've actually played that scenario at Gen Con, had a great time. It ended up being very complex, but yeah, that's, a, that's more like it. Yeah. 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 Um, well, the next one, how about killing PCs? Is that a no, no? Is it appropriate? Well, it's sure. Sure. Okay. At a con with the caveat that perhaps the, a caveat, I don't even know. It's just occurred to me. You say at the beginning, death is on the table. Yep. And if there's, and if you're using pre gens, it shouldn't be an issue. If no. they're bringing their character, I don't know why they would, but it's possible, I guess. Maybe RPGA, it's a, maybe, society. maybe something like that. But if, if you're providing pregens, death, yeah, obviously. I've not GM'd much of Pathfinder Society. I did in year zero and year one a little bit. But it seemed like their encounters were built to be defeated by halfway proficient players. Mm -hmm. And you needed some really bad luck to die, even at low levels. Um, you could make an argument. I paid four bucks. My character died in the first scene. That would, that would suck in old school if you're running a first level adventure in old school that could happen you know yes. without even trying too hard so i think but i would think players that sit down to play first edition ad and d first level characters realize i need to be careful about when i engage in combat right so right know. but anytime you've got random chance so you can roll natural 20 max that back and max on the damage dice and you know, some, some monsters, they do, they pull a crit, just an off chance, pull a crit. You're dead. There's not really yeah. anything you can do about it. But you know, you fix that and I've done it too, by having extra. Extra care. Yeah. Dude, have extra care. Like, look, okay. Dude's dead. In comes our old friend, Tom. Hey, where you been, man? Hey, help us fight this stupid orc. <laughs> There's a cage behind the orc that, yeah. and you know, you get that guy out of there. He can help you out. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I say the best for last safety tools <laughs> everyone knows we love them okay so if we were in the same room right now <laughs> even just bringing up safety tools it makes the environment room. unsafe for randy <laughs> yeah no doubt dude um, okay at a con though maybe that's the place you're going to use them 
or yeah. on anytime you're dealing with strangers, safety tools are kind of a, you know, you have to think about them. I but, would say it would only be, I would only do it. God, I, I would probably only do it if I'm going to run something that's going to be a little, in my mind, a little bit either risque or maybe something really dark. Um, your characters are going to make a deal with the devil and you're going to have so much time limit before you die and go to hell. And if people want to face, deal with that sort of difficult thing, I would warn them up front, some supernatural horror is about to happen. So if I, if I ran a con game mm -hmm. and um, someone at the table, I probably wouldn't advertise safety tools. I probably wouldn't mention them in any documentation, mm -hmm. online documentation or anything people would read before signing up. But if yeah. once people are at the table and they ask, what about safety tools? I'd say, hey, you know, if something comes up and you feel the need to stop play because you're offended or because it's something you can't deal with and we, we can't do that, mm -hmm. um, here's your $4 and we'll, we'll call it good. Or yeah. um, you can feel free to leave. Right. Um, I'm not going to bring up stuff that anybody, unless they're really It'd looking be pretty, to be offended. A pretty heavy corner case for someone to be offended at my table. Right, because there's not going to be any sexual situations. It's always going to no. be fade to black if it even, is it even going to be if a it even exists. So the only way that um, when I run a game, someone is going to get offended is if they get offended at orcs being the bad guys if right. they're in the game or some other what some people might call too tropey uh, whatever you know look and there is no safety tool that will protect you against my evil orcs right the only safety tool is getting up and walking away right right and I think so that's a, yeah yeah and so, have a kind of non-issue we don't even talk about it right no it's not right so we know each other really well if we have a heartburn about something we say it yep. or don't and bite, bite our lip it's not, I mean, I'm sure there's people who maybe wanted to say something, maybe they didn't, yep. but we don't, we don't lose friendships over oh. small, small potatoes that happen at a game. Yep. Yep. All right. That's, that's all I'd come up with. You got any other ideas for con games? You thought I made things I might've missed? Um, I don't think so. Um, if I miss something, our fellow con, cabin con guys want to talk about, please call in or in an email or if anybody out there has ideas of things that we may have skipped over for your experience in con play um yeah just give us a holler so yeah i think the i think the most important thing about running and we and i think we took we mentioned it running mm -hmm. a a con game i think is for it to be unique maybe but definitely interesting and fun and engaging yeah um, you need to Whenever make I sure. Me, I, I would even say something that you don't get to do very often. The Terrasque, you don't get a very off, big opportunity to fight the Terrasque yeah. in whatever form you do it. You don't get a big opportunity necessarily to sneak into an Archdevil's secret vault. Right. I mean, that doesn't usually happen in a campaign. Right. Or, you know, how cool would this be? I and mean, this would be so, this would blow Joe's mind if I did this. Your second level characters, and you each have six match guidance to start the game with. And I mean, good match guidance, not potions, permanent match guidance. Oh. I mean, you'd be like, what? And Let's do that. Go. Let's see. I know. It'd be kind of cool. I, I, I may do that. That's a cool idea. Yeah, but what you don't know is I'm going to throw an ogre mage at you. <laughs> yes, because he wants your magic items. There's a second level party, and they've got six, they got 12, six times six, 36 magic items. You guys would be in so, so much trouble. Target. That, we would be if that got targets. out, you would be targets, man. A bunch of bandits come in and steal you blind. Yeah. One of the magic items is going to have to be a bag of holding. We're going to put all but one of them in there. <laughs> Whenever we go anywhere. We right. go into town, put your stuff in the bag. I got a plus three sword. Take any dude. chances. You are a second level thief. I don't care if you have a plus three dagger. Put that thing in there. You yeah. don't want someone to take that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. All right. All right. Yes. Shall we move on? Yes, we shall. And it was hey. my idea to move on because yes, I'm in charge today. My bad. I didn't even think of moving on. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm stepping all over Joe's toes. He's getting, he's getting prickly about this. Yes, I'm raising my eyebrow. Anyway, like it, love it, or leave it. I will. We're going to learn you some things about us today. Yeah, baby. So I'll go ahead. Soft drinks. <laughs> that's bad yes they're not good for me i like diet i like non-diet i like fizzy drinks yeah weak weakness is soda yeah no doubt uh, yeah i know that I like, it. I like it way too much but it's funny i'm not a mountain dew guy i like the dark soda i believe joe likes them you you're more of the light soda guy you like yeah, the mountain i don't dew, like dark right colas. Yeah. They, yeah they they have a very i don't like them yeah I like Pepsi and Coke and crap like that. Yeah, you're a weirdo. I am. Um, philosophy. Oh, love it. I love it. I think at times you can go down a rabbit hole where it gets a little weirdo stuff. But generally speaking, I mean, mathematics is an offshoot of philosophy. It's a type of logic, you know, logic-based philosophy, and and symbolic lo symbolic logic is a you know kind of a, a pre a, a, precursor. A, precursor to mathematics mm -hmm. but philosophy is in many ways the king of the sciences yeah well philosophers have been trying to answer the question of are we real or are we figments of our own imagination for okay. thousands of years and have not been able to formulate as far as i know any mm -hmm. truly unassailable you are real you are you are real because of, except right. I think for me, the closest has uh, anyone has ever come isn't really a proof, but I think it's good enough. And yeah. it's, and it's, I said, I can't remember if it's Hegel. Mm -hmm. I think therefore I am. And that's not uh, what we thought, what I used to think of it, what it, what meant before I learned what it actually meant. Yeah. I used to think that it meant because I, I have imagined myself into existence. Everything exists because I'm imagining it. And that's not what that means. No. It just means I'm a the thinking fact deep. that I'm thinking proves mm. that I exist. Right. But do dogs think? I guess they do. But they also exist. True. But the fact that I'm thinking pretty much negates the whole, all this thousands of years of well, we are a real because of this and that and the other thing, esoteric stuff. No, you're questioning, you're thinking you are real. Just yeah. Oh, and, and the debate of is there a God eventually comes to a person's philosophy on things. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a tough, yeah, I, I like it. It, it, it really shapes our, our world. I mean, everybody's worldview is basically on some sort of philosophy, whether you know it or not. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's important. And, and, and I really love it. Yeah. Now, it's possible that I have that wrong on some level, what yeah. I just said. Sounded if good. So, if so, let me know. But that's what I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure of that. Don't but, tell me. I, I, I would never want to know that Joe could ever be wrong. So yeah. that would hurt me badly. I know. Okay. We'll keep it a secret. Anyway, mm -hmm. dice. Dice, dude. Huh. Let me see. I wonder what I think about dice. I think I like them. Maybe, I'm but sure you keep I... them imprisoned in that spherical glass they are, thing. They are precious to me. <laughs> um, got, yeah, uh, went to a comic con with my buddy Jeff this past weekend. And one day he bought a D100 a little bigger than this dude. And it was a weapon, a metal D100. And it rolled pretty well. A metal D100 that big? Oh, dude. It's a straight-up weapon. But, yes, I do like me some dice. I'm slowing down the collection part, though. I'm starting to look. I like metals. So I'm mainly only buying metals every once in a while. They got to blow me away. So, but yes. Yeah, because they're wicked expensive. They are. The metals are, yeah. I've paid, I haven't bought any. I've paid in the neighborhood of 30-ish bucks for a set of metals. And that's not the high end. No, but, no. Uh, that's kind of the beginning. So, but I do like my, I do like my dice. Yeah. I would say strong light to almost love. Okay. But you buddy, how about camping? How do you feel about camping? I wish I could go. I like it. And I wish I could go more often 
to uh, know whether I love it or not. When was the last time you went camping? And did you did you rough it or did you stay in a cabin? It's been a long time. Cabin con is technically camp. is cabin con considered camping? The closest cabin con has ever been we could ever consider cabin con camping was the first one because it, it only because the cabins had mud floors. <laughs> yeah, they did, dude. That was pretty cool. The walls, yeah. the walls and ceiling were were made of wood like material. Yes. <laughs> Was it pressed board or was it or actual wood? I can't remember. I think it was wood. The beds weren't impressive either. No, no, no. <laughs> they were definitely rough. So you say you think you like camping, but you need to explore more to be sure if you loved it. No, right. So like for sure, mm -hmm. I would like to be able to do more to determine whether I love it. Me too. I haven't camped since I was young yeah. and I never camped in a tent. I only camped in a sleeping bag. We'd find trees and sleep under them. Mm -hmm. So... That was still pretty fun. Um, this is a pretty broad one. Art. Art. Oh, yeah. Art's great. Yeah. Uh, I don't like modern art. I think most no. modern art's crap. Right. But uh, I definitely love art. Okay. Well done. Art. Weekly RPG campaigns. Love. <laughs> You would love a week every Friday, six o'clock at least at night. That goes without saying. <laughs> well, you just said it. <laughs> well, I had to because you asked me, but I mean, I know. really. So let's do it, man. What are we screwing around for? Uh, we have lives. Screw lives. D and D is our life. Yes, it's a community. <laughs> it's community. Be a part of it. Community. <laughs> okay. Cool. Oh, community. All right. So are we done with that? Yeah. Ready to move on? Move us on, sir. All right. We're going to play in the mud. Yes. Meet in the mud. Yeah. So we're going to discuss our mud sword code, our, our, our project code named mud sword, which we didn't play last Saturday like we promised. Somebody got sick on this podcast. Well, I. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I got a little phlegmy and coughing a lot, and so did my wife. So we figured it might be, a, you know, the greater part of valor to stay home and make sure we didn't spread any germs around. Yeah, just in case. Of, just yeah, in yeah. case. Yeah, good. It was it was cool. We still had four people over. We had a, good, had a big long visit. We just talked our butts off. But my plan was, and it is the next time we play, I'm going to be. Uh, work, I'm working on turning. I don't know if you noticed. You probably have in the most recent. The update I've sent to you, Joe, that turning undead, I have a chart for mm -hmm. and saving throws. Um, I'm going to, we have, we're currently using a single saving throw as a number, a la swords and wizardry. <clears throat> and we modify it based upon your race, your class. They give you some bonus, bonus different situations, different situations. And I'm using roughly, I'm trying to marry a, an idea that Joe loves. He loved in third edition and Correct me if I'm wrong. You love reflex, will, and fortitude. Yeah. And I think I agree. It's a good, very solid three saving throws, kind of covers the gamut. Um, currently, I'm enamored of a single make the saving throw, something about that I like. So I'm trying to marry a single number where if you have a bonus to reflex saves, you would add it to your target number. And I'm kind of going old school. So, like, I think your second level wizard has a 16. Is that the wizard saving throw? Do you remember? It's either 16 or 17. Yeah, it's oh, pretty hard. No. I think it went to 16. Yeah. Did it go to 16? Yeah, and it gets no. better once every five levels. Yeah, so it didn't because it hasn't reached fifth level. Right, so it's 17. And I'm currently, and I think I'm going to have to change this. I want to play test it. Uh, and the scenario I had ready had you probably making multiple saving throws, which I know mathematically people are in trouble. And I think... Joe had talked to me, you talked to me before about you think I need to add the appropriate ability score modifier to the save. And I think you're right. I think that you're going to need that help. Um, fighters get a bonus to fortitude. I think dwarves get a bonus to sort of a fortitude save. I think you could, if you had a high constitution, you get a bonus to fortitude. If I add that in, um, I got a feeling I'm going to find that out. But right now, I still lean toward just playing it as it is and see what happens. Well, it was um, an option in Beckme. 
or at least in at least in the rule cyclopedia to add stats it was really oh okay um we also joe and i joe took a uh lion's share of the project and he he did his uh, spell description for magic users. You want to talk about your, did you have a philosophy, a design philosophy as you were working on the, you, he, he rewrote the first level spells from Beckme, or at least the rule cyclopedia in a format that he quote unquote liked. What, what was your, well, plan? essentially, um, yeah, okay. None of them are functionally different. Right. So um, the rewrites are ma- mainly to reduce redundant language, mm-hmm. um, correct grammar, uh, not so much spelling, but there's some grammar issues and some redundant okay. language. Um, right. So, um, some there are some spells where the duration is mentioned as a line. Um, so you have the like the name of the spell, its level, and um, duration, maybe targets and stuff like that as one line or as uh, lines above the description, and then you have the a paragraph or so of description. Yeah. So some some spells will mention things that are in those lines above, like it, it it can do this many targets where it's you've already mentioned it up there, so you don't need it in the description. So um, I've taken I, I would just went through them and you know just I think had better language. Oh, I think so too, and I appreciate you getting to to me early. You actually inspired me a little bit. Were you surprised that there weren't that many first level magic user spells? Yeah, there's not that many, and I, I, I like that as a base game. Yeah, me too. Having uh, a small set of base spells that you could consider like rote or common. It's at least within the sphere of magic users. I mean, not common that everybody uses them, but common magic. And then if you want to add other things, those could be unique, or those could be you know brought in at a later time in the game D&D something like that or, or any, any D type spell you could borrow from yeah uh, yeah i really like that you know when i did the, and i did a similar for the list for the clerics but i'm taking a different tact um i don't know if you i don't know if you read my cleric descriptions for their they're called miracles and we're using a spell point system for clerics but we're using a Vancian system for wizards at low levels and so clerics get their wisdom modifier plus their level in quote unquote miracle points and what i did was and i don't know if you read it or not joe i tried not i tried not to fully mimic like light is different for a cleric than it is for a wizard for a wizard it's light and they can turn it into darkness i may have given them the darkness option but i want to take it away i called it holy light and if you notice it's a little more buff than a regular light spell. It lets them do some stuff to evil creatures. But my idea is, I don't think right now I envision clerics getting spells past fifth level. And they're miracles. Not character so level. Right. Fifth, fifth level, level spell spells. Level. Yeah. They're gonna be fifth level miracles. Because my idea is the cleric is going to be a quasi holy templar, almost paladin type. I'm, I'm calling them right now the lawgivers in my campaign. So they all worship Lohas. So a cleric is not generic in, in our world. It's at least right now, he is a follower of Lohas. And um, so what I'm going to do is I want their miracles. They're going to, they're going to feel like things they can just call down from the, they don't memorize things. So clerics feel powerful. They can call any miracle they want based upon their spell points, their miracle points. Um and I had several spells that I kind of changed things around. I'm thinking I'm not going to let them reverse. I have them reversing cure light wounds. And I think I'm going to take that away. I don't think I'm going to let them do that. Um, I think I'm going to make them more specific, more narrow. But in that narrow band of what they can do, I'm going to give them a few little tweaks. Like Holy Light, if you read it, it's pretty good. It can do stuff to demons and devils and undead. They got to make a special saving throw or they can't enter the area of effect. Well, clerics so, in, in this uh, game don't get miracles or spells at first level, right? Correct. Correct. So you have to wait till second level. Mm-hmm. And then it's fine. You, um, It's not light. It's holy light. So you have a correct. different name for it. If you I'm were perfect. going to just say for clerics, have the light spell, but it works differently, I would say probably need to change the name. It would be better. Right. And I also, and they have a few spells currently that they do share with wizards, but a lot of them I didn't like. The ones they shared, I tossed. I want them to be different. I want wizards to be the kings of versatility and overall spell power. 
I want them to be the ultimate in arcane casters. I want the cleric to be a guy who can call in divine might from time to time to do some things. I really think initially, like in second level, think about it. If you got a plus two to your wisdom modifier and your second level, that's four miracle points. And every first level miracle costs you one. So you're they're jumping two, four spells a day, hmm. which is pretty powerful. So I may have to play around with that, but I'm yeah. going to try it right now. I'm going to try it right now. I'm hoping I can make it such a narrow band of abilities that you as the cl- wizard won't feel like crap. The clerk's a better caster than me because he could be initially, right? And maybe we fix it by cutting the points down or maybe we fix it by giving wizards maybe a bonus based on intelligence in terms of what they can memorize. I don't know yet. So that's where I'm working at. I'm, it's going to be a huge leap from first to second level for a cleric as I have it written right now. They're going to go from nothing to like, I mean, think about it. And if you have a wisdom, probably plus two, you're looking at four power miracle points. That's four spells. Whereas your wizard's casting what, two? At second level, yeah. Yeah. Two, spells, so gonna, two first level spells. Yeah. And granted, he can't do, he can't sleep people. He can't magic missile people. You know, you'll still be, you'll be doing damage. He's not doing much damage. Okay. Right? He can yeah, help people. That might be all right. It might be. I mean, if you we'll look, have to, we'll have to play it. We're going to have to see. And um, yeah, so I, I don't see them. And I, I can't remember my chart. I wish I had it handy. I don't have it with me. I'm not sure if they gain spells. I, I know the turn undead table. If you look, I made it pretty hard. Oh, oh yeah. Not uh, the, not the near cake walk that, uh, typical D D has no 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 uh, it starts at 11 instead of most of them starts at single digits for a skeleton i made it 11 and it doesn't progress like theirs for many levels it stays the same and it jumps up and i use a pattern of basically at the higher 15th level i believe it goes you gotta roll a five and a seven even at 15th level you don't have any automatic makes ah so i'm making that because i'm thinking 36 level you gotta roll because i want turn undead to be good but i don't want it to be you know, I want much. a little more. Yeah, I don't want an encounter ending. Yeah, automatically time. turn vampires at second level. Yeah. Know, what is it, seventh or eighth that they can? Yeah, seventh or eighth level, you're turning vampires with like the six or seven yeah. or nine, maybe. That's kind of ridiculous. And what that would mean almost, that would almost ensure that a crafty DM would throw more than one vampire in there. And then vampires drain two levels a hit. And if you right. have three or four vampires in there, you're going to just, dec- so what? You turned one of them. Yeah. John Allen Large had a recently had an episode on level yeah, draining. Yeah. And I, I'm with him. I kind of yeah. like the idea of draining con. Yeah. And I like it coming back unless mm-hmm. you go to zero. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I like that. That's yeah. probably a better way to do it than levels. Yeah. You got to do a whole lot of adjusting with levels. Yeah. With con, you just got to adjust your hit points. And I yeah. think it probably it would probably be good to just do the level con drain the conjuring yes. not yes. damage as well probably just con. Oh, right probably you're so. taking damage you are taking damage yeah. yeah the only time you wouldn't be was when you're between nine and 12 yeah or nine and 11 if you're at 11 with the way because we're doing the third edition modifiers so between 11 and nine you could take a couple of hits and not lose anything other than oh crap and i like how john says i think you get a point back a day Something or like D, that. Or D3. So it's like, oh my God, I have a 16 con, but now I have a seven. And I'm going to have this for, you know, crap, six days or seven days, you know. Unless you can find restoration somehow, if that's even. Which is going to be a miracle of some sort. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna have that be a thing. Right. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And, and yeah. you know, we, we may find the clerics a little bit too buff, but I'm, uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Yeah. But that's all that I really had thought about for this one. So I don't know if you had other comments about things on turning undead or anything with, with, with uh, where are you at on playing in the mud? Have you been doing any more dabbling? Or are you waiting for the next um, play? To- no, it's mostly in my head about factions within the, within yeah. a fictional, within a, a fantasy, the fantasy world. Uh, uh, setting- but I do have a question. Yes. Do we want to post any of our, revisions online as like a blog post or do you want to keep Um, it under wraps for now i think i think i want to do it relatively soon uh but the the play test document i'd like to play play test version two first Mm -hmm. we only really have what we really have that we could put out there is pc creation rules 
Right. And then, of course, spells. And for first level, first, second level characters, we have nothing but first level spells done. But yeah, we could absolutely put those out there and let people see it and see what they think. I hope to have a full, I would love to have a full blown PDF. I wish it would, I could say at Christmas, that won't happen. Mm -hmm. um, but by next year, maybe the summer. I'd like to have a PDF we could post for folks to look at and see what they think. It wouldn't be a full-blown game. It'd be basically rules on spells and magic and playing characters. Joe did, uh, he doodled a little druid up for us. We didn't have the druid. And we got, I think that needs some more massaging. Right, before I'll probably put it does. I, I like the idea of, especially the shape-changing fighter. Okay. Anything else on the mud? That's all. I don't think so. All right. Cool. Hey, I think it's contest time, isn't it? Yes, let's do, do that. that before we before we bug out. Yeah. Yes. Okay, got my faithful D fourteen. D fourteen. Uh, we have thirteen. Okay. People. Yep. Yeah. Give me the high sign, baby, and I'll roll this bad boy. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, D fourteen. I'm going to subtract one. If I get a one, I will re-roll. Here we go, and the winner is number three. Number three. Let's see what number three is. One, two, see three. Hockey puck junior. I know who that is. Yes. All right. Hockey puck junior. All right, hockey puck. Give us a contact. That's gonna be that's gonna be some uh cheap mailage posting. So just just uh, FYI, yep. had FF Warmy confirmed, <sighs> it would have been FF Warmy. Dude, come on, Warmy. So I'm getting to the point where I think FF Warmy, since they have, still have not con confirmed their email, mm -hmm. that it might have been a bot or something like that. However, if you want to uh, make sure that if you're FF Wormy and you're listening to this and you're yeah. like, no, I'm real, I'm real. Um, confirm. Uh, it may, I may have to resend the confirmation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to, okay, I can do that right here. Cause he hadn't done that last time either. He would have, he had a chance to win something. I think he was in the, in the running. Yes. Okay. He was in the running, but he didn't roll him. It's just, okay. We didn't yeah. concede. Well, he's not in. He's not. He or she is not in the running because he is not confirmed. If he had been there, I would not have to have done the very difficult mathematics of subtracting one, as we right. talked about last time. Subtracting is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> I could have just rolled my D fourteen, which would have been sweet. Yeah. Dang it, Wormy, dude. All right, so we're looking at a hundred people next time for the next giveaway. The next giveaway is Contest at one hundred. Okay. Uh, I'm going to verify that we are still at six. We well, okay. I'm going to refresh. Yes, Ooh. we are 67. at 67. All right. Uh, last week we had 48. Oh, so okay. It's almost a 20 subscriber bump. Sweet. So thank you to all of the new subscribers yeah. who are watching or listening. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks to. Jason and John Allen for their call-ins. Yes. And that was to cool. Josh, um, silent, silent Josh, Josh. <laughs> for sending us the news item of right. sixth, sixth edition or 5.5 .5 or revised or whatever it's going to be. Yes. The version of D&D &D we're not buying. So. Yes. Yes. Most, uh, unless somebody takes between now and the time it comes out, they take it in the the direction of D&D &D back to actual D&D &D and away from representation D&D. &D. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. It's not going to happen, though. That's all right. Sorry, we got our game. Mud Sword's coming along, yeah. dude. Yeah. That's the next big craze. It will be. Yeah. Guaranteed. Mud Sword. Are we ready to head on out, then? We are, man. Yeah, let's all do right. it. Take us home, Big Daddy. All right. Well, if you'd like to support our show, please help us get the word out. Tell your friends, family members. And your enemies. Yeah. Especially your enemies. Yes. To check out our show, our website at biggestgeekestpodcast.com. And if you'd like to support us, there are ways to do that there at the support tab. Mm -hmm. um, 
check us out on Odyssey and YouTube as well. Um, I'm a little behind on on uh, I've gotten our latest episode, not counting today, um, mm-hmm. out on Odyssey, but I've got a kind of a gap there I got to fill, so yeah. so we can have most of our stuff out there. So right. Odyssey and YouTube, um, um, subscribe, like, do all the stuff that you normally do. Rate us uh, on i on iTunes if you're listening to us there or Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called now. Um, I don't know why you're you, you're even doing Apple iTunes because they suck. I do Apple iTunes. Yeah, well, I'm sucky. I'm sucky is what he's saying. Yes, yes. Okay. Whatever podcast you're listening to, give us a thumbs up or like or whatever if that's what you feel like you should do. Um, if you need to email us. The email address is thegeeks at biggestgeekestpodcast.com. Any questions or comments at all? Yep. Um, we have, we're going to have a, uh, several links in our show notes. Please check that stuff out. We like it. You should too. Yeah. Yes. If you don't, you suck. <laughs> like his partner. <laughs> yes. And right. with that, if there is nothing else, this is Joe. And I'm Randy. And remember, if you can't be big like us, then be geeks like us.